Welcome. This long video is an introduction to covalent bonds. You learn how to draw structures of covalent compounds, use electronegativity to identify bond type, ionic, polar covalent, or covalent bonds, use VESPER, valence shell electron pair repulsion, to draw three-dimensional shapes of molecules, and combine dipoles in polar covalent compounds to determine overall molecular polarity. Let's get started. We're going to be using the octet rule as a guide. That is, we'll make sure our structures obey the octet rule, which tells us that atoms will bond so that every atom acquires eight valence electrons in the valence shell to become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas and gain stability. Now that applies to most of the A group element compounds with the exception of perhaps hydrogen, lithium, and beryllium which are close to helium and they will become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas helium obtaining two electrons in the valence shell. That's sometimes called the duet rule. Broadly speaking there are two ways an atom can bond metals transfer electrons to nonmetals forming ionic compounds. A simple example is lithium atom bonding with a fluorine atom. Lithium is a group 1A reactive alkali metal with one valence electron in its second shell. And fluorine is also a second period element but it's a reactive nonmetal that has an incomplete and almost full second period shell. And so lithium with low ionization energy is easily stripped of its one valence electron. Fluorine will take that to complete its valence shell. We wind up then with an ionic compound, which we have a lithium cation with a charge of plus one and a fluoride anion with a charge of minus one. Electrostatic attraction of opposite charges holds these compounds together as solids with high melting points and strong bonds. The other option is nonmetals reacting with other nonmetals, in which case neither one is able to take electrons from the other or give for that matter. So in fact they share electron pairs forming covalent bonds. Perhaps the simplest example is a hydrogen atom sharing with another hydrogen atom. Each have one electron in the valence shell. These two atoms simply move together and overlap the valence shells such that now both electrons are shared by both atoms. Let's look primarily now at nonmetals reacting with nonmetals or metalloids by sharing electrons and producing these covalent molecules. Carbon forms millions, literally tens of millions, of organic compounds that are molecular covalent compounds. And let's look at methane. That's a simple example. Carbon is in group. 4A and has four valence electrons. It's a nonmetal, and hydrogen has one valence electron. When these five atoms come together, the hydrogens will come in and overlap with carbon's four valence electrons, producing four shared pairs of electrons. I'm drawing these shared pairs as single lines. These are called line bonds. Each line bond represents a shared pair of electrons. By doing so, all four hydrogens become isoelectronic with helium, and carbon becomes isoelectronic with neon. This is a preferred and stable state for methane. Let's distinguish between electron dot structures and Lewis structures. So here we have the formation of a methane molecule again. If we show the shared pairs of electrons simply as pairs of electrons or pairs of dots. This is called an electron dot structure. It gets pretty tedious to keep track of all the electrons in electron dot structures, so we prefer to use line bond structures, also called Lewis structures, in which each line represents a shared pair of electrons. Just a note to all chem students, you must always show all the valence electrons in an electron dot structure or in a Lewis structure. So much chemistry occurs at non-bonded electrons that we need to keep track of them. 
Now in methane there are no non-bonded electrons, but in subsequent examples we'll see them. Let's take a look at the Lewis structure that would represent the molecule silicon hydrogen chloride bromide iodide. Sounds complex, but it's really quite simple. We need to first determine which atom is central, and I'll give you more detail in just a bit, but for now, if you look at the Lewis symbols of the atoms, you can see that silicon, which is in group 4A, needs to form four bonds to become isoelectronic with argon, the nearest noble gas, where the halogens and hydrogen only need one bond, so it makes sense in this case that silicon must be central. We must keep track of the total number of electrons in every structure that we draw. Silicon is in group 4A, it's a semi-metal, four valence electrons, hydrogen in group 1A, and the halogens, chlorine, bromine, iodine, are all in 7A, and each bring seven electrons to the structure. Let's tally up these electrons, four for the silicon, one for the hydrogen, and seven for each of the three halogens. Gives us a total of 26 valence electrons, divided by two is 13 electron pairs. So here we see we have four shared pairs of electrons, four line bonds, and we have three, six, nine non-bonded pairs, also called lone pairs of electrons, for a total of 13 electron pairs. And that's consistent with what we calculated, and we must neither create or destroy electrons because mass is conserved in all chemical reactions. Just a word of warning here. When you're drawing a Lewis structure, you should never wind up with a situation like this. This is called a free radical, a single unpaired electron. There are structures in which single unpaired electrons exist. They're called free radicals, and they're particularly reactive and unstable. But we won't be looking at those in this video. We'll be considering cases where we have even numbers of electrons, which you may find surprising, but most do have even numbers of electrons in their structures. So be mindful of that. No single unpaired electrons remain in your structure. They should all be paired up, either as line bonds or non-bonded pairs. So considering covalent bonds between non-metals and non-metals or metalloids, there are two ways that this can occur. If an atom such as hydrogen, reacts with another hydrogen atom, in other words, its own kind, then the shared pair of electrons are shared equally. So here we see this shared pair of electrons spends equal time in and around the two hydrogen atoms that are sharing it. It's shared equally. But when a nonmetal forms a covalent bond with a different type of nonmetal, as for example hydrogen bonding with fluorine, the shared electron pairs are often shared unequally. One atom is said to be more electronegative and holds the shared pair more of the time. So here in the case of hydrogen bonding with fluorine, we see their shells are overlapped, but I've drawn it such that we can visualize that the shared pair of electrons spend most of their time near the fluorine and little of their time near the hydrogen. This doesn't give rise to an ionic bond. We say that fluorine is partly negative. This is the symbol delta, the Greek lowercase letter d, and it indicates partial negative charge, and hydrogen is partially positively charged. Now, a partial charge is not the same as a full ionic charge. Non-metal to non-metal or metalloid bonds are never ionic, but even a partial charge has very significant effects on the properties of molecular compounds. A partial charge separation, as we have in hydrogen fluoride, is called an electric dipole. And we often draw a dipole arrow pointing in the direction of the atom that holds most of the shared charge. So here's the dipole arrow over the hydrogen to fluorine bond, pointing towards the more electronegative atom, fluorine, the one that holds most of the negative charge. On the tail of the arrow, there's a plus sign reminding us that's delta positive. So we're saying here that fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. That is, it hogs the shared electrons. A covalent bond with unequally shared electrons is called a polar covalent bond. 
And then what is electronegativity? Electronegativity, which I'll abbreviate EN from time to time, is the relative measure of an atom's strength of attraction for its shared bonding electrons compared to other atoms. Here's a table of electronegativity values, or at least a partial one. In 1954, Linus Pauling was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work in chemistry, a good deal of it related to this. Linus Pauling assigned electronegativity values to all of the elements on the table with the exception of the noble gases since they don't normally form compounds. I'm showing here just the A group elements. It's only the A group elements that we'll draw structures for in this lecture. You can see on the table that fluorine is the most electronegative element with a value of 4.0. Fluorine in fact is the most reactive non-metal. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element. Chlorine and nitrogen are tied for third place, and then bromine follows. Following that is iodine and carbon tied at 2.5. So the nonmetals have the highest electronegativity values, the highest force of attraction holding their bonding electrons. On the lower left side of the table, we find the lowest electronegativity values. For example, cesium and francium are typically rated at 0.8 to 0.7. These are the most reactive metals and they most freely give up their electrons. They hold them the least. So notice the general trend is from lower left to upper right increasing electronegativities. As you go down any group in the periodic table, for example look at group 4A, carbon is a non-metal and then silicon and germanium are semi-metals and tin and lead are metals. As the metallic character of the elements increases down each group, the electronegativity lowers. And as the non-metallic character increases up each group, so does electronegativity. What do we use these for? We can calculate the difference in electronegativity, well, symbolized delta En, between two atoms to find the polarity of a bond. In the example we just looked at, in the case of hydrogen fluoride, the difference in electronegativity is 4.0 for fluorine and 2.1 for hydrogen. That difference is 1.9, and that bond is very polar. Electrons are not shared equally. In the case of methane, which we looked at earlier, the difference in electronegativity between a carbon-hydrogen bond is 2.5 for carbon and 2.1 for hydrogen. It's only 0.4, and carbon-hydrogen bonds are in fact nonpolar. In the diagram on the top left, we see two lobes representing the shape of the electron cloud, two electrons in a covalent bond moving at high speeds between and around the two nuclei that are being held together. The electron cloud is relatively symmetrical, that is, the electrons are spending equal time around each of the two atoms. That would be the case when you have a nonpolar bond, two elements that have the same electronegativity or very close together. In the image in the middle here, we see the electron cloud is distorted. Electrons are spending most of their time around the atom on the left and less time on the right, giving rise to these partial positive and partial negative charges. This represents a polar covalent bond like hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen being represented by the delta plus end and fluorine being represented by the delta minus end. The shared pair of electrons in the covalent bond is unequally shared. In the image here on the right, this is the extreme case, something like lithium and fluorine. Lithium has actually lost its valence electron and has a positive charge. And fluorine has gained a valence electron and become an anion. Fluoride, there's complete charge separation, and this is an ionic bond. How can we predict which bond is being formed? Well, that's where Linus Pauling's table comes into play. So we predict the type of bond by using scales such as the one you see here. If the bond is between a metal and a non-metal, as for example lithium and fluorine, we use the upper scale and the difference in electronegativity tells us whether the bond is nonpolar covalent, 0 to 0.4, 
delta En from 0.5 to 1.4 is classed as polar covalent, and at 1.5 difference in electronegativity or above is classed as ionic. If, however, the bond is between a nonmetal and nonmetal, or nonmetal and metalloid, we then use the lower scale. Again, 0 to 0.4 difference in electronegativity represents a nonpolar covalent bond, but a difference in electronegativity between 0.5 and 2.2 .2 would be polar covalent. Notice there is no position here for an ionic bond because ionic bonds are not formed between nonmetals and nonmetals or other metalloids. So there's no simple scale that is always correct. Uh, this scale, in my experience, gives the best predictions. I have a couple examples here. If we want to determine the bond type, say for example in calcium sulfide, a metal to nonmetal bond, we calculate the difference in electronegativity. In this case, sulfur is 2.5, calcium is 1.0, the difference is 1.5, and that falls in the ionic region in the upper scale. In fact, calcium sulfide is indeed ionic, as indicated by its very high melting point. It's a high melting solid with a melting point greater than 2500 degrees Celsius, clearly ionic. For HCl, we calculate the difference in electronegativity, 3.0 for chlorine and 2.1 for hydrogen. That difference is 0.9, and we would look on this lower scale for comparison of nonmetal to nonmetal bonds, and 0.9 falls in the polar covalent region. Let me briefly mention one aspect of polarity that's important. Um, water has very polar bonds. The difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen is 3.5 minus 2.1 or 1.4, and that's definitely a strong dipole. As a result, uh, water molecules hold together more strongly than nonpolar molecules of similar size. In this representation of a water molecule, these polar covalent bonds are indicated by the dipole arrows pointing in the direction of the more electronegative oxygen atoms. These dipoles won't cancel, they'll combine together to give an oxygen which is partially negative and hydrogen atoms which are partially positive. The molecule is said to be polar and has a dipole moment. The effect of this can be seen when water molecules are near each other, as in the liquid or solid state. These dotted lines represent a type of intermolecular force of attraction between the partially positive hydrogen atoms and partially negative oxygen atoms of adjoining molecules. The effect of this is a dramatic increase in melting and boiling points of water compared to nonpolar molecules such as methane. Both water and methane are similar in size, but look at the enormous difference in their melting and boiling points. Methane melts from solid to liquid at minus 182 degrees Celsius and boils at only minus 162 Celsius. Very weak forces of attraction hold methane molecules together because they're nonpolar and doesn't take much heat to separate them. By comparison, water melts from solid to liquid at zero degrees C and has to be heated up to 100 degrees Celsius to completely separate these molecules into the vapor state. They have very high intermolecular attraction owing to their polarity. So now we're going to learn to draw Lewis structures of covalent molecules. We'll start with simple ones and move to more complex molecules. Here are the set of rules that we'll follow will ensure that all atoms in our structure are isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. Now, it's not true in all cases, but in this first chemistry course that we're looking at, we'll follow that rule. Keep in mind that no unpaired single electrons should be present in your structures, no free radicals. This is an important rule to keep in mind. It will help you when you draw these. All the nonmetals and metalloids can form single or double bonds, with the exception of hydrogen and fluorine. They can only form a one bond.
and accept carbon and nitrogen, which can form single, double, and even triple bonds. When we lay out our structures, it's important to know which atom is central. As a general rule, almost always true, the least electronegative atom is central because it's best able to share electrons. But remember that hydrogen and fluorine are monovalent, so they won't be central. Here's the guidelines we'll use for drawing these Lewis structures. Number one, we'll count the number of valence electrons of all the atoms. We'll divide it by two to find the number of electron pairs. That simply makes it easier for counting. Number two, we'll use single bonds to join all the atoms together and that's two electrons per single bond. We'll join them to the central atom, which will be the least electronegative atom, and we'll make this structure as symmetrical as possible. In the model on the left, I have two carbons being covalently bonded to four hydrogens. And hydrogen can't be central, and so carbon has to be. Now, in the model on the left, I've added the hydrogens unsymmetrically, whereas in the model on the right, the hydrogens are added symmetrically. And in most molecules, atoms are arranged symmetrically around the central atom. So picture a dotted line down the center, like a mirror, and the two halves look alike. This is symmetrical, and you should draw them in that way. In virtually every case, it's correct. Rule number three tells us that we will draw the remaining electrons as lone pairs, that is non-bonded pairs, on the outer atoms to complete their octet, followed by lone pairs on the central atom. So in the case of carbon dioxide, which I'm in the process of drawing here, carbon is in group 4A and brings 4 electrons. Each oxygen brings 6 electrons for a total of 12 and 4 is 16 valence electrons, or 8 pairs. So having connected together the central atom to the outer atoms with single bonds, that takes care of two pairs of electrons. I have six more pairs to add. I add them to the outer atoms in pairs, two at a time, giving the outer atoms a noble gas configuration, which means oxygen would have eight electrons in the valence shell, so it needs three more pairs. So I'm counting here, it's two, three, four, five, noble gas configuration, six, seven, eight noble gas configuration for the other oxygen. Rule number four, if the central atom or any other atom does not have an octet, like carbon in this case, then move non-bonding electron pairs from the outer atoms to form double or triple bonds. So in this case we can see the central carbon only has two pairs of electrons, it needs four. So each oxygen can share one of its non-bonded pairs of electrons, forming two double bonds on carbon, and now all atoms have a noble gas configuration around them. And finally, multiple bonds, double or triple, are much stronger than single bonds. It makes a more stable molecule. So whenever possible, use lone electron pairs to change single bonds to multiple bonds, provided that an octet is maintained. That's the cardinal rule here. We can't exceed eight electrons on around any atom, and no more than two in the case of hydrogen. There are a couple exceptions to the octet rule involving boron and beryllium compounds. Let's look at boron first. Now boron is in group 3A. It has three valence electrons. It's a metalloid. It's certainly not electronegative enough to gain five electrons to fill the valence shell, nor is it metallic enough to lose three electrons to empty the valence shell, so it's relegated to covalent bonds. And since it only has three electrons to share, it can only form three single bonds under normal circumstances. So here's borane, BH3, with a total of six valence electrons, divided by two, is three pairs. And those three pairs of electrons represent the boron to hydrogen bonds, which are in fact relatively nonpolar. Boron has an electronegativity of 2, and hydrogen is 2.1. The difference is only 0.1, and that's clearly nonpolar covalent. So boron does form uh, compounds with incomplete octets, which makes it a fairly reactive and unstable compound as compounds go. 
So here's a model of BH3, boron hydride. We see boron with only three covalent bonds to hydrogen, only six electrons in its valence shell. It has an incomplete octet. Another exception we see occurs with beryllium compounds. Now beryllium is a metal with electronegativity of 1.5 and if it's combined with a reactive enough nonmetal like fluorine or oxygen will form ionic compounds but if it's combined with a nonmetal with a relatively low electronegativity value like hydrogen well the difference in electronegativity is not sufficient to be ionic and in fact it is covalent. It's polar covalent but it has an incomplete octet. In beryllium hydride there are a total of only four valence electrons or two pairs and that's the structure. It's linear has an incomplete octet. Here's beryllium hydride. We see it has only two covalent bonds to hydrogen, only four electrons in its valence shell. That being said, most of the A-group elements do comply with the octet rule in their covalent compounds. Let's begin with some simple hydrocarbons, ethane, ethene, and ethine. Ethane has the formula C2 H6. We must first count the number of electrons. Group 4A carbon brings four electrons and there are two of those. And group 1A hydrogen brings one electron each and there are six of those for a total of 14 valence electrons or seven pairs. Hydrogen can't be central so attach the hydrogens around the central carbons making the molecule symmetrical. By doing so, we count that we already have used up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of electrons, so they're all counted for. This is the structure of ethane. Now, it wouldn't be that shape. The bond angles wouldn't be 90 degrees because we're drawing it on flat paper. Remember, these are in three-dimensional space. Let's take a look at what the molecule would actually look like in three dimensions. Note that ethane is symmetrical. Each carbon is bonded to three hydrogens and has eight electrons in its valence shell, a complete octet. Let's take a look at ethene, also called ethylene. Ethene has the formula C2H4, two times four electrons for the carbons, four times one electron for each hydrogen for a total of 12 valence electrons or six pairs. The central atom will be carbon in this case. Join the hydrogens to them in symmetrical fashion. That takes care of one, two, three, four, five electron pairs. There's one left over. That extra pair will go on one of the outer atoms. Does every atom have a noble gas configuration? Well, in fact, no. Carbon needs to share one more pair, so let's move one of the non-bonded pairs of electrons from carbon to make it a shared pair of electrons. And in that way, the carbons now have the noble gas configuration of neon. Please note that when you move a non-bonded pair of electrons in and form a bond with it, the atom hasn't lost them. They're still in the valence shell of the carbon on the right, so you're not losing any electrons by sharing them. Let's take a look at the actual shape of an ethylene molecule. Note that in ethene, also named ethylene, the carbons share a double bond in order to ensure that they have eight electrons in their valence shell. Ethine, common name is acetylene, has the formula C2H2. Total number of electrons, 4 times 2 plus 1 times 2, 10 valence electrons or 5 electron pairs. After connecting the carbons and hydrogens by single bonds, we've accounted for a total of 3 pairs of electrons. We have 2 more to add. Add them to the outer atoms doesn't matter if you add them to one side or the other. You'll quickly see that carbon needs to have more electrons in their valence shell, so use those non-bonded pairs to form a triple bond between the carbons 
giving each carbon the noble gas configuration like neon having eight electrons in their valence shell. Please note in all the hydrocarbon structures carbon always has four bonds. Let's take a look at the three-dimensional shape of an ethyne molecule. Because ethyne has only two hydrogens, the carbons form a triple covalent bond to complete their valence shell octet. Let's take a look at the structure of carbon dioxide. How many electrons are in carbon dioxide? Four for carbon and six for each oxygen. Six times two is 12, plus four is 16 electrons, divided by two is eight pairs. What's the central atom here? Carbon is less electronegative than oxygen. It's 2.5 versus 3.5, so that is correct. But furthermore, and even more importantly, carbon needs to form four bonds. And if you put carbon on the end of the molecule, there's no possible way it can form four bonds with one neighboring atom. It has to be central. We connect the atoms together by single bonds. That takes care of two pairs. We have six more to go. Add those to the outer atoms, giving each atom a noble gas configuration. That's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We'll look at the structure and say, does every atom now have a noble gas configuration? Well, auctions do, of course, because we planned it that way, but carbon does not. We can move an electron pair in from each of the oxygens to form two double bonds on the carbon, giving it a noble gas configuration. Now you might be thinking, and you should be thinking this way, is what would happen if I took two pairs of electrons from the same oxygen instead of one from each side? Wouldn't that also make sure that every atom has a noble gas configuration? That's correct. This oxygen on the left has eight electrons in the valence shell. The carbon in the middle has eight electrons in its valence shell, and so does the oxygen on the right. So what's wrong with this? Well, oxygen cannot form a triple bond. It's only carbon and nitrogen that can form stable triple bonds that simply will not form. So make sure you remember that carbon and nitrogen are the only two atoms that can form triple bonds. So we've seen then that carbon can form four single bonds, a double and two single bonds, a triple and a single bond, or two double bonds, in every case, four bonds. Let's take a look at the three-dimensional shape of carbon dioxide. These models show only bonded electron pairs, not the non-bonded pairs. We can see that carbon shares eight valence electrons, two double bonds. We can't see that both oxygens also have complete octets, but in fact they do. Let's take a look at some simple covalent compounds of nitrogen. Let's start with ammonia. Ammonia has the formula NH3. How many electrons does it have? Five for the nitrogen, group 5A, and three for the hydrogens, a total of eight valence electrons, or four pairs. How do we connect them together? Nitrogen has to be central, even though it's more electronegative than hydrogen, because hydrogen can't be central. We connect those atoms together with single bonds. One pair, two pairs, three pairs. One pair left over. We place the non-bonded pair on nitrogen because hydrogen can't take any more. Take a look at the Lewis symbol of nitrogen. Nitrogen has three unpaired electrons and a, and a pair. And notice how when it bonds, it has no single unpaired electrons left. In fact, single electrons on atoms will always form bonds. The non-bonded pairs may or may not form pairs. Let's take a look at the three-dimensional shape of an ammonia molecule. We can see nitrogen's three covalent bonds to hydrogen. We can't see its non-bonded electron pair, but it's there. So nitrogen has a complete octet, eight electrons in the valence shell. Note that ammonia has the shape of a three-sided pyramid. 
dinitrogen difluoride, N2F2, five times two electrons for the nitrogens, seven times two is 14 electrons for the fluorines, that's a total of 24 valence electrons, or 12 pairs. What atom is central? Well, nitrogen has an electronegativity of three, and fluorine is four, so nitrogen is central for that reason, but more importantly, fluorine, like hydrogen, is always a terminal atom. It only forms one bond. We join the atoms with single bonds first. That takes care of three pairs of electrons. We add the remaining electrons starting at the outside and work our way in. This is pair number four, five, and six. Fluorine has noble gas configuration. Seven, eight, and nine. This fluorine has noble gas configuration. Ten, 11, 12. So all of the atoms have noble gas configuration except this nitrogen on the left, but we can accommodate it by sharing a pair of electrons from the nitrogen to form a double bond between the two nitrogens, and now every atom has a noble gas configuration. So nitrogen can form single bonds, or a double bond, and we're going to see an example next where it can form a triple bond. In nitrogen, elemental nitrogen in the air, N2, there'll be 5 times 2 is 10 valence electrons, or 5 pairs. We connect the nitrogen atoms by single bond, and we're going to count up to 5. This is 2, 3, 4, and 5. And that gives the nitrogen atoms a triple bond. So notice that nitrogen, like carbon, can form single, double, or triple bonds. Let's take a look at the three-dimensional shape of a nitrogen molecule. Well, it's not much to look at. Although we can't see it, each nitrogen has a non-bonded electron pair in addition to their triple bond, thereby securing eight electrons in their valence shells and attaining the noble gas configuration. Next, we're going to look at the structure of some ions, so not just neutral compounds. We'll start with acids. Acids contain acidic hydrogens and acids react with bases by giving up hydrogen ion, a plus one cation. Now take a look at this model. This is a hydrogen atom. It has one proton and one electron and it's neutral. If it loses its one and only electron, it's going to have a charge of plus one and therefore hydrogen ion is actually a proton. We use the term proton and hydrogen ions synonymously because they are in fact the same thing. Hydrogen sulfide, the formula is H2S, has two acidic hydrogens. Both of these hydrogens can be removed by base. When hydrogen sulfide is partially neutralized by a base, it loses just one H+. And we can show that by this reaction equation. We'll say H2S loses one H plus to the base and what's left is HS minus. Reaction arrows are like equal signs. The mass on both sides of the equation must be equal, as well as the charge. We have two hydrogens and one sulfur on the left. We have two hydrogens and one sulfur on the right. The mass is balanced. The charge on the left is zero. The charge on the right is plus one and minus one, which is also zero. So if H2S loses one H plus, that H plus leaves its electron behind, it's now sitting on the HS, and that's why it has a negative charge. Let's draw the structure of hydrogen sulfide and HS minus. In the case of hydrogen sulfide, the number of electrons is two for the hydrogens, six for the sulfur, eight in total, four pairs. Sulfur has to be central because hydrogen is terminal. We connect them together with single bonds. That's two pairs, and there's two to go. We place those non-bonded pairs on the central sulfur. There's no other place for them to go. And now hydrogen sulfide 
has noble gas electron configurations on both sulfur and hydrogen. So that's the correct structure. Now, being an acid, when it loses a hydrogen ion, then the pair of electrons, this line that's being shared, must stay behind with the sulfur. In order for hydrogen to leave as H+, it must leave its electrons behind. And that produces H+, and then H, S, minus. So this shared pair of electrons that I'm coloring green becomes this unshared pair of electrons that's now owned by the sulfur. That's an acid ionization mechanism. And so we've directly drawn the Lewis structure of HS minus by figuring it out from the structure of hydrogen sulfide. Now we can also draw the structure of HS minus using our rules. It works fine. Let's count the number of electrons in total. There's only one hydrogen this time, so that's one electron. Six for the sulfur, but we have to add one more electron because it has a negative sign in the formula. That's the extra electron that was left behind when the hydrogen ion left. So again, we'll have eight valence electrons as before and four pairs. We join hydrogen and sulfur by a single bond. We add three more pairs as non-bonded pairs on the sulfur. And remember, we have to put a negative sign in here because there is a negative sign on HS minus. So here we've drawn the structure of HS minus using our rules, and that works fine. But we've also drawn it starting from the structure of hydrogen sulfide and showing how hydrogen sulfide ionizes losing hydrogen ion. And this gives, I think, a better understanding of the structure of HS minus. Let's look next at a base. Bases neutralize acids by taking hydrogen ions from acids. And ammonia is a base, NH3. It takes one hydrogen ion from an acid. Here's the reaction equation. NH3, a base, takes one hydrogen ion and forms NH4+. That's called ammonium ion. Cations that end in IUM ending are positively charged cations. Can you follow the mass and charge? The charge on the left is 0 plus 1 is plus 1. The charge on the right is plus 1. The mass is also balanced. So to draw the structure of ammonia, 5 electrons for nitrogen, 3 for the hydrogens, 8 in total, 4 pairs. We connect all the atoms together. Nitrogen must be central. That's three pairs. With the remaining pair will become a non-bonded pair on the nitrogen. Now when that reacts with hydrogen ion, it uses its non-bonded pair of electrons to form a bond to the hydrogen ion because hydrogen ion has no electrons to share. It can only accept and the base donates its electrons. And that gives us the ammonium ion which now has four non-bonded pairs of electrons. So track it with me here. This non-bonded pair of electrons that I'm coloring green becomes this shared pair of electrons in the ammonium ion. And note that the ammonium ion has a charge of plus one because the equation tells us that. A charge of zero on the left plus hydrogen makes plus one on the left and it's plus one on the right. We can also draw the structure of ammonium ion directly from our rules. We could count electrons, we'll say five for the nitrogen and then four for the four hydrogens, but we have to subtract one because one of these hydrogens didn't have an electron with it, right? That's the positive charge. You need to subtract one electron for every positive charge. So again, we have a total of eight valence electrons, or four pairs. Connecting the atoms together, we put them in and we have four pairs and we're done. Nitrogen has a noble gas configuration, but don't forget the positive charge on the nitrogen. Ammonium ion is positively charged. Hydrogen cyanide, HCN, is a poisonous acid gas with a vanilla odor. Hydrogen cyanide loses one hydrogen ion when it reacts with a base. So here's the reaction equation. HCN, which is neutral, forms H plus and CN minus cyanide ion. How do we draw the Lewis structure? Let's count electrons to start. Hydrogen brings one electron. 
carbon brings 4, nitrogen brings 5 for a total of 10 valence electrons divided by 2 is 5 pairs. Which atom is central? Well carbon electronegativity is 2.5, it's less than nitrogen at 3.0 so it has to be central hydrogen can't be, but even more importantly carbon forms four bonds and there's no way it can form four bonds if it's terminal, it has to be central. So in the first structure I've connected the atoms together by single bonds that takes care of two pairs of electrons and there's five in total so I need to add three more pairs to the outer atoms giving them noble gas configuration. Here's pair number three, four, and five. So those are all the electrons carbon needs more electrons in its valence shell so nitrogen can share two pairs with it forming the molecule HCN. All the atoms have noble gas configuration now. Now to draw cyanide ion we start by counting the electrons four for carbon, five for nitrogen and add one because as a negative charge there's one additional electron in cyanide more than the the atoms themselves normally bring. That's a total of 10 electrons or 5 pairs. We only have two atoms to join, so that's one pair of electrons here. We have four more pairs to add. Now where do I add them? Well, start on the outside. This is 2, 3, 4, 5. And what if I add them to nitrogen first and go 2, 3, 4, 5? It makes no difference. We need to share electrons so that both atoms have a noble gas configuration. So carbon could share two pairs to form cyanide or nitrogen could share two pairs to form cyanide. It comes to the same thing. Here's the structure, the Lewis structure, of cyanide ion. Now if we go back to the structure of hydrogen cyanide we could directly arrive at this if we just said when hydrogen cyanide acts as an acid it loses a hydrogen ion and the pair of electrons that was shared stays with the carbon because H plus doesn't take any with it and that would give us our structure of cyanide directly. I want to introduce to you a type of acids called oxyacids. Oxyacids contain oxygen because they're oxyacids. They contain hydrogen, acidic hydrogens because they're acidic and they also contain a non-metal. An example here is carbonic acid, H2CO3, some hydrogens that are acidic, oxygens, and a nonmetal. We'll deal with carbonic acid specifically in a few minutes, but let's start with um, the oxyacids of chlorine. Now there's a very important rule about how we draw or lay out the connections in oxyacid, and it's true for all oxyacids. I know of no exceptions to this, and I've typed it in red and yellow so that you get it. In oxyacids, acidic hydrogens are always bonded to oxygen, and all of the oxygens are bonded to the central nonmetal, which means that all acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens are bonded to the central nonmetal. I repeated it because it's so important. It makes structures easy to draw, and I know of no exceptions. Now, there are, in the case of chlorine oxyacids, there are actually four of them. I'm going to draw all four. We'll start here with this first one. Uh, HClO is hypochlorous acid. Add one more oxygen becomes chlorous acid. One more oxygen still, HClO3 is chloric acid. And with four oxygens we get perchloric acid. Turns out that the more oxygens added to an oxyacid, the stronger acid it becomes. We'll start with hypochlorous acid first, HClO. Notice the formula, HClO. Is that, is that the layout? No, it's not. Remember in oxyacids, acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen and oxygen to the nonmetal. So the formula does not give us the correct layout. Let's get the number of electrons. One for hydrogen, seven for chlorine, six for oxygen, a total of 14 valence electrons or seven pairs. Now that we know the layout, we'll connect hydrogen to oxygen and oxygen to chlorine by single bonds. That takes care of two pairs of electrons. We have to count up to seven, starting at the outer atoms first, making them isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. This is three, four, five. That's isoelectronic. Then move inwards, six, seven. And oxygen is also isoelectronic. That is the structure of hypochlorous acid. 
our method works quite nicely. Let's look next at chlorous acid, HClO2. Number of electrons. Well, it have one for hydrogen, seven for chlorine, and this time we have six times two or twelve electrons for the two oxygens. Twelve plus eight is twenty. Ten pairs. We know how to connect them together, right? Acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens are bonded to the nonmetal. So here we have three single bonds. We're going to count to ten pairs. So that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. When you're adding pairs of electrons, you will never encounter a situation where you have more electrons than you have places to put them. They can't be because we only add as many electrons as there are in the atoms. If you wind up with too many electrons, it means that you miscounted. You have too many electrons. There are occasions, as we've seen, where we add all the electrons and not every atom has the noble gas configuration, in which case we bring outer electrons into share. That's okay, but you'll never have a case where you have too many electrons to, to place. Hypochlorous acid, HClO2. Next we'll look at chloric acid, HClO3. Number of electrons, 6 times 3 is 18, plus 8 makes 26, divided by 2 is 13 electron pairs. In oxyacids, all acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygens, and all the oxygens bonded to the other nonmetal. That's the layout. We've taken care of 1, 2, 3, 4 pairs. We have to count up to 13. There's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Satisfied the outer atoms, work your way in. 11, 12, oxygen has an octet, and 13, and now chlorine has an octet. That is the structure of chloric acid. Let's look next at perchloric acid, HClO4. 6 times 4 is 24, plus 8 is 32 electrons, divided by 2 is 16 electron pairs. We connect everything with a single bond. In oxy acids, all acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens are bonded to the central nonmetal. One, two, three, four, five pairs. We're counting up to sixteen. Here's six, seven, eight, octet, nine, ten, eleven, octet, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, octet, fifteen, and sixteen. That is the Lewis structure of perchloric acid. Next, we'll look at carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is the acid that we drink in carbonated beverages. Simply add these together. Add together CO2 and H2O. You get H2CO3, carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid is diprotic. It means it has two acidic hydrogens. It can release two protons. We're asked to draw its structure and the structure of the carbonate ion, CO3-2, that forms when carbonic acid loses its two hydrogen ions. Let's count the electrons first. Two for hydrogen, four for carbon, 18 for the three electrons for a total of 24 valence electrons or 12 electron pair. How is it connected together? That's easy because in oxy acids, all acidic hydrogens, and both of these are acidic, we're told that, right? Two hydrogen ions. All acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens are bonded to the other nonmetal. So the layout is quite simple. We join them all with single bonds. That's one, two, three, four, five pairs. We have seven pair to go. We start adding the outside first. S six, seven, eight. That has an octet, 9, 10, oxygen has an octet, 11, and 12. All the atoms have an octet, except for carbon in the middle, but we can satisfy that. If we move one of the electron pairs from the outer oxygen in to form a double bond, then carbon has an octet, and the outer oxygen still does. That's carbonic acid. The hydrogens in carbonic acid are acidic because they're bonded to oxygens, which are bonded to this C double bond O group. The C double bond O group is called a carbonyl group. 
you'll learn in your organic chemistry that most organic acids contain the carbonyl OH group. So now we have to draw the structure of carbonate ion. Now we can do it directly by using our method. We add the number of electrons, 4 plus 18. And then we have to add two more because it has two negative charges. We find again there's 24 valence electrons because when hydrogen ion leaves, it leaves its electrons behind. We can draw it, but let's go the other route. Let's start with carbonic acid since we drew it, and we'll just say the acid, when it ionizes, when it loses hydrogen ion, it leaves the pair of electrons behind. Those that are being shared between the oxygen and hydrogen remain with the oxygen. That's the only way that hydrogen ion can be a cation. It has to leave its electrons behind. And what's left then is the carbonate ion, CO3 minus 2. So we're saying that this pair of electrons, and I'm coloring green, is this non-bonded pair of electrons. It's no longer shared. And this pair of electrons that's shared, it's colored blue here, is this non-bonded pair of electrons in the carbonate ion. So there's carbonate and carbonic acid. Let's draw some more oxy acids. Sulfur has two oxy acids. There's H2SO4 and H2SO3. H2SO4 is sulfuric acid and H2SO3 is sulfurous. So an oxy acid with one less oxygen than the ic acid is called an us acid. Sulfurous acid has one less oxygen than the ic acid. We'll start here with sulfurous acid. Sulfur is in group 6A like oxygen. That's 24 electrons plus 2 is 26 valence electrons or 13 pair. How do we connect it together? Well, that's easy because it's an oxy acid. All acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens are bonded to the other nonmetal, which is sulfur. That takes care of one, two, three, four, five pair. We have to count to 13, starting at the outer atom first. Six, seven, and eight. Oxygen is isoelectronic with neon. Nine, 10, 11, 12. Both these oxygens are isoelectronic with neon. One pair left over, put it on the central sulfur, and now all atoms have a noble gas configuration. And that is the structure, the Lewis structure, of sulfurous acid. Sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Total number of electrons. Sulfur is in group 6A, like oxygen, so 6 times 5 is 30, plus 2 is 32 valence electrons, divided by 2 is 16 pair. How are they connected together? Acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens bonded to the central nonmetal. So that takes care of one, two, three, four, five, six pair. We have to count to 16, starting at the outer atoms first. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. These two oxygens are isoelectronic with neon. 13, 14, 15, 16. These oxygens are isoelectronic. In fact, all atoms are isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas, and that is the structure of sulfuric acid. There are two oxy acids of nitrogen. So the one with more oxygens, nitric acid, is HNO3, and nitrous acid has one less oxygen than nitric acid, and that's nitrous acid HNO2. How do we draw nitric acid? Count the electrons first. 6 times 3 is 18, plus 6 makes 24 valence electrons, divided by 2 is 12 electron pairs. How is it laid out? Well, that's easy, because in oxy acids, all the acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens are bonded to the other nonmetal. So connecting together with single bonds gives us 1, 2, 3, 4, pairs. We have to count to 12, starting on the outside first. 5, 6, 7. This oxygen is isoelectronic with neon. 8, 9, 10. Isoelectronic. 11, and 12. There's all 12 pairs. You can see the central nitrogen needs another 
pair of electrons to share, and either one of these oxygens can provide it, giving us the structure of nitric acid. You might be wondering, why can't this oxygen that's bonded to hydrogen share one of its non-bonded pairs of electrons with the central nitrogen and form this structure on the right? And if you look at it, every atom in it has a noble gas configuration. So what's wrong with this? It's difficult for me to give you a, a full and true answer without going deeper than we are studying in this course. But let me say this, that oxygen having three bonds is less stable than oxygen having two bonds or one bond. And for that reason, it just doesn't form. I know of no case where the OH group in an oxy acid is doubly bonded to the central non-metal. Let's now draw the structure of nitrous acid. HNO2 has one less oxygen than nitric acid, HNO3. The number of electrons will be 1 for the hydrogen, 5 for the nitrogen, and 12 for the two oxygens. For a total of 18, divided by 2 is 9 electron pairs. How is it laid out? Well, we know that acidic hydrogen is bonded to oxygen and all the oxygens bonded to the central nonmetal. We currently have three single bonds or three electron pairs. We want to count up to nine. This will be four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. That's all the electrons. Nitrogen does not have an octet, so the outer oxygen can share a non-bonded pair to make a, a double bond. And by doing that, all the atoms have a noble gas configuration, and that is the structure of nitrous acid. Let's take a look at nitrous acid's molecular shape in three dimensions. Well, there's not too much I can say that I haven't already said more than once in this model. All of the atoms, oxygens, and the nitrogen have a noble gas configuration if we include the non-bonded pairs of electrons that are not visible here. Phosphoric acid is another oxy acid, another common oxy acid. In fact, it's the flavor of root beer. Small quantities give a flavor of root beer in colas. It has the formula H3PO4 it is triprotic. That means it actually releases three protons or three acidic hydrogens when it reacts with bases. We're asked to draw its structure and that of phosphate ion. We'll start with phosphoric acid. How many electrons? Well, three for the hydrogens, five for the group A phosphorus, and 24 for the group 6A oxygens. 24 and 8 is 32 valence electrons or 16 electron pair. And I don't dare repeat again how we know it is connected together. We know that the hydrogens are bonded to oxygens and oxygens to the central nonmetal. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of electrons. We want to count to 16 pair, starting at the outside. Eight, nine, ten, isoelectronic. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Every atom now has an isoelectronic with nearest noble gas configuration. Now to draw phosphate ion. So we could draw the structure of phosphate ion by counting electrons, but since we have the structure of phosphoric acid right here, let's derive it. We'll say that each of these three acidic hydrogens leaves and leaves a pair of electrons behind and that will give us phosphate. Let's track these electrons. I'll say that this shared pair of electrons is now this unshared pair left behind. That produces one hydrogen ion, one proton. Let's say this shared pair of electrons is now this non-shared pair of electrons. That releases another hydrogen ion. And let's say this shared pair of electrons is this pair now, and it is 
releases a third hydrogen ion, and that's phosphate ion. The last oxyacid we want to look at in this lesson is acetic acid. Acetic acid is different in that it is an organic acid. The other ones we've looked at were inorganic, even carbonic acid, although it has carbon, it's treated as or referred to as an inorganic acid. But acetic acid is truly a organic. This CH3 part is the organic part of the molecule. And you may, no doubt, have tasted acetic acid because vinegar is a 5% solution of acetic acid in water. Now organic acids obviously contain some acidic hydrogen, but they often, most often, will contain non-acidic hydrogens as well. And these non-acidic hydrogens are the ones, the hydrogens bonded to carbon. And they're not acidic because they're non-polar. It makes them non-acidic. The only acidic hydrogen in acetic acid is the one bonded to oxygen, not the three hydrogens bonded to carbon. Now, you may not know what's what yet, but as we look, draw the structure, you will see what I'm referring to. Let's draw the structure. Acetic acid has the form of the CH3COOH, and the number of electrons, we have four for carbon, three for the three hydrogens, four for the next carbon, 12 for the two oxygens, and one for the final hydrogen for a grand total of 24 valence electrons, divided by two is 12 electron pairs. When we connect them together with single bonds, these three hydrogens are bonded to the carbon. That's what makes them non-acidic. A carbon to hydrogen bond is non-polar and is quite strong. They are not going to be released in water. So there's the CH3, and then we have the COOH. So the right part of the molecule is drawn out as any of the other oxy acids. The acidic hydrogen is bonded to oxygen and all oxygens to the central nonmetal. So we have 12 pairs. We've identified 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We have 5 more to go. We'll start at the outside. 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. When we're done, we have a carbon in the center that does not have an octet. So we move one of the non-bonded pairs of electrons to form a double bond, and that is then the structure of acetic acid. Let's take a look at the three-dimensional shape of an acetic acid molecule. So in the structure of acetic acid, we see the three hydrogens bonded to the carbon. Those are nonpolar bonds. Those hydrogens are not acidic. They will not be released in water as hydrogen ion. The only acidic hydrogen is the one bonded to the oxygen, which is bonded to the carbonyl group. This is an example of an organic carboxylic acid. We're next asked to draw the structure of the acetate ion. It's the ion that forms when the acid loses it's hydrogen ion. And since we have the structure of acetic acid right here, it's easy to do. You can see that when acetic acid ionizes to lose hydrogen ion, the pair of electrons stays behind. So this shared pair of electrons becomes one of these three non-bonded pairs. Acetate has a charge of minus 1 because hydrogen is plus 1 and the total charge on the right is 0 which equals the total charge on the left which is also 0. There's a structure of acetate ion. Next we want to look at resonance structures, the meaning of which I'll explain as we get there. Let's start by drawing the structure of sulfur dioxide. It's a gaseous covalent molecule, so it has the formula SO2. There's six electrons for the sulfur and six for each oxygen, so a grand total of 18 valence electrons or nine pair. What's the layout? Which atom is central? Sulfur has an electron negativity of only 2.5, whereas oxygen is 3.5, so sulfur is central. We connect the three atoms with single bonds and that takes care of two pairs of electrons. We have to count from two up to nine starting at the outside. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One pair left over, put on the sulfur. 
we've taken care of all nine pairs of electrons. We look at the structure and say everything has a noble gas configuration except for sulfur. Let's say the oxygen on the left shared one of its pair of electrons to form a double bond to sulfur. And by doing that, we have a more stable structure in which all three atoms have a noble gas configuration. But then you say, well, what about the oxygen on the right? Could that not have donated a pair of electrons also? What about here? Well, yes, it could have. And that would give the structure on the right. And it is also correct. So, in fact, there are two possible structures of sulfur dioxide, the one on the left or the right. And so, when that happens, these are called resonance structures. In fact, the true structure of sulfur dioxide is thought to be some kind of a average of the two structures. These are of equal probability, so the true structure is some kind of blended average. We draw resonance structures in square braces and we connect them with a two-way arrow. What about sulfur trioxide, SO3? It's an acidic gas and when dissolved in water it produces sulfuric acid. In fact, here's the equation right here. Just add those atoms together, SO3 and H2O makes H2SO4. If we can draw the resonance structures of sulfur trioxide will start by counting electrons. 6 plus 18 is 24 valence electrons, 12 pair. So when we draw these out we'll have three single bonds to start. We'll count 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The 12th electron would go on the outside. We would recognize that sulfur needs a pair of electrons, one more, so this oxygen on the left would share and brings us to that structure. But you no doubt recognize that all three of the oxygens could have donated and so if the top oxygen donated instead of the left we'd have the double bond on top. If the oxygen on the right donated the pair then we'd have the double bond on the right. And all three of these structures are equally probable resonance structures so we draw all three of them in square braces and connect the structures with two-way arrows. It's resonance. Let's draw the resonance structures of ozone, O3. So ozone is not the normal form of oxygen. The normal form is O2, so oxygen actually has two elemental forms. It can be O2 or O3. We're going to draw O3. Ozone is in the upper atmosphere. It protects the Earth from high energy electromagnetic radiation, EMR, that is damaging solar radiation. Let's draw the most stable structure. So we start with the number of electrons. We have here 3 times 6 is 18 divided by 2 is 9 pair. We'll connect the oxygens together with single bonds. That takes care of 2 pair. We'll count to 9, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 1 is 9. You can quickly see that the central oxygen needs to share one more pair. So let's say the oxygen on the left shares one of its non-bonded pairs, giving us this first resonance structure with a double bond between the two leftmost oxygen. And now all atoms have the noble gas configuration. But you can quickly see that the oxygen on the right could do the same thing. And so the structure on the right is also an equivalent resonance structure. Both of these are equally probable. We must draw them both in square braces joined by a two-way arrow. Let's talk about a potential incorrect structure. What if we took this model of ozone, our first structure, and said why can't we move two pairs of electrons? Why can't we share two pairs with the center? And that would give us this structure here. What's wrong with this structure? Well, the problem is the oxygen in the center now has five pairs of electrons around it. One, two, three, four, five. And that's not possible. You can't have more than four pairs of electrons around the central, around any atom for that matter, using the octet rule. And furthermore, um, oxygen does not form a triple bond.
So in both counts, that's not a good structure. Nitric acid HNO3 is a strong acid. Draw all resonance structures of the anion formed. It's called nitrate ion when HNO3 loses hydrogen ion. Since I don't have nitric acid drawn here, we'll just start from the formula and we'll count electrons. 5 for nitrogen, 18 for 3 oxygens, that's 23, and we have to add one more because it has a negative charge. So 24 valence electrons divided by 2, 12 pair. Nitrogen is central because its electronegativity is 3 and oxygen is 3.5. So that takes care of three bonds. We're going to count to 12, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We're good, except nitrogen needs to share one more pair. So one of the oxygens, let's say the one on the left, shares a pair with nitrogen giving rise to this first resonance structure, which has a negative charge. Don't forget to put that in. But we could also draw structures where the top or the rightmost oxygen share the pair, giving rise to three possible resonance structures for nitrate ion in square braces connected by a two-way arrow. So far we've drawn Lewis structures without any regard to their shape. We're drawing them on like they're as if they're flat on a piece of paper. But remember they're actually in three dimensions and the shape is really important as it turns out in terms of its chemistry. So we're going to use a model for predicting molecular shape. It's called VESPER. It's an acronym for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. Now think about what the words means. It simply means pairs of electrons, electron pairs, in the valence shell repel each other. And it's so simple, yet surprisingly accurate in predicting molecular shape. See, like charges repel. And electron pairs, whether they're bonds or lone pairs, non-bonded pairs, it makes no difference, they're still electron pairs, around a central atom will repel each other and move as far away as they can from each other in three-dimensional space. So to use VESPER, we simply draw the Lewis structure, including all non-bonded electrons, like we were before. Then we count the number of pairs of electrons. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's a lone pair, non-bonded or bonded is still a pair around the central atoms. Further, because single, double, and triple bonds all occupy one region of space, we're going to count double and triple bonds the same as if they are single bonds. And I'll explain what I mean by that on the next page. Then we simply arrange the electron groups as far as possible from each other in three-dimensional space around the central atom to determine the shape. Here's how we count electron groups. A single bond is one electron group. A double bond is one electron group. And a triple bond is one electron group as well. Lone pairs are one electron group. So take a look at carbon tetrachloride. Remember, we're thinking about the central atom here. How many electron groups around the central atom, around carbon? There are four single bonds. There are four electron groups. How about the carbon in formaldehyde? How many groups of electrons are around it? There are three, two single bonds and the double bond. The double bond is only one electron group. Those two pairs of electrons are stuck together, if you will. They occupy the same space. How about in hydrogen cyanide? The carbon in the center is surrounded by only two electron groups. A single bond on the left, a triple bond on the right. A triple bond is counted as a one electron group. And finally, in the case of ammonia here, the central nitrogen atom is surrounded by four electron groups, three single bonds, and a non-bonded electron pair. There are three possible three-dimensional shapes for molecules. If we have two electron groups getting as far apart as they can from each other, 180 degrees apart, they would have a linear shape or straight, as in, for example, beryllium hydride. If we have three electron groups repelling each other and getting as far apart as they can from each other in three-dimensional space, 
they would be 120 degrees apart, forming what's called a flat triangle. The term we use is triangular planar, as for example in BH3. When there are four electron groups around the central atom, getting as far apart as they can from each other in three-dimensional space, the bond angle is 110, not 90, because it's not flat. This is harder to visualize. It's called tetrahedral because the four points, if we put surfaces on all four of these points, we have four surfaces. A hedron is a surface. Easier is seen with a molecular model. This is methane. It's four carbon to hydrogen bonds moving as far apart as they can from each other in three-dimensional space give bond angles of about 110 degrees. It's tetrahedral. You can approximate these shapes with some fat balloons. If you take two fat balloons and join them together they'll be generally in linear shape. If you take three fat balloons and join them together then they'll be in a flat triangular shape. If you take four fat balloons and join them together they would form a tetrahedral shape. Let's look at some linear molecules. Beryllium hydride, BEH2, carbon dioxide, CO2. They both have linear geometry. Now beryllium hydride has two single bonds. Carbon dioxide has two double bonds but in both cases we have just two electron groups around the central atom. Let's look at some trigonal planar molecules like boron hydride. Apologies for the typo in the notes. And this is formaldehyde. This is NOF. And all three of these have three electron groups around the central atom. And so in all cases their electronic geometry is described as being trigonal planar. Sometimes we want to look at just the atom groups around the central atom. Well, in the case of boron hydride, there are three atom groups in the same positions as the electron groups. The geometry of the atoms is described as the molecular geometry rather than the electronic geometry. There are three atom groups around the central carbon and they also have a trigonal planar molecular geometry. But in the case of NOF, there's only two atom groups. So if we just look at the atom groups, ignoring the non-bonded pair of electrons, we'd have to describe the atom group molecular geometry as bent, sometimes called angular or sometimes called V-shaped molecular geometry in NOF, which is different than its electronic geometry. The only time that the electronic geometry and the molecular geometry will differ is when there are one or more non-bonded pairs of electrons. If all of the pairs of electrons are bonded pairs, then in every case the electronic geometry and molecular geometry will be the same. So here, just by way of reinforcement, uh, we have the trigonal, planar, molecular, and electronic geometry of BH3 and formaldehyde. But here we have NOF, which has a trigonal, planar, electronic geometry, but a bent molecular geometry. So here are some images by way of reinforcement. This is the structure of methane without regard to its shape. If we view it in three dimensions, it's going to look more like this, 110 degree bond angles. In this case, the molecular geometry and electronic geometry are the same. They're both tetrahedral because there are no non-bonded electron pairs on the central atom. Let's take a look at ammonia, NH3. It has four electron groups, as we can see in its Lewis structure. Three of them are bonded pairs and a non-bonded pair. So the electronic geometry will look tetrahedral, at least approximately so. You see again there's four surfaces if we fill this in. The electronic geometry of ammonia is tetrahedral, but if we don't consider the non-bonded electron pair and consider only the three atom groups, well that wouldn't be tetrahedral, would it? That's described as being trigonal pyramidal, in other words, a triangular pyramid. Here we can clearly see 
the trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry of the ammonia molecule. Take a look at water. Here's the Lewis symbol of water. Two non-bonded pairs and two bonded pairs. So of course its electronic geometry will be approximately tetrahedral considering all four pairs, but if we take away or don't consider the non-bonded pairs, it leaves us with just the atom groups around the central oxygen atom. It would look like this, and that's called bent or V-shaped. Some books call it angular. Your choice. So although the electronic geometry of the water molecule is tetrahedral, its molecular geometry is bent angular or v-shaped. Here's a summary page of what we've studied with regard to Vesper. So consider a molecule like carbon dioxide. It has two electron groups, two double bonds, and also two bonding groups, the two oxygens. It has no lone pairs. Its electron geometry, arrangement of electrons, is linear, and the molecular geometry, the arrangement of the atom groups, is also linear. If we have three electron groups and three bonding groups, as in the case of formaldehyde, three electron groups, a double bond, two single bonds, and three atom groups, then both electron geometry and molecular geometry will be trigonal planar. However, if we have three electron groups but only two bonding groups, as in the case of sulfur dioxide, it has a non-bonded pair. In this case, we'll have three electron groups. That'll be trigonal planar electronic geometry. But looking just at the atom arrangement, that's described as a bent molecular geometry. We have four electron groups and four bonding groups, like in methane. Then both of these are tetrahedral electron geometry and tetrahedral molecular geometry. But if we have four electron groups and only three bonding groups, as in the case of ammonia here, the electronic geometry is still tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry would have to be described as being a triangular pyramid or trigonal pyramidal. And finally, if we have four electron groups but only two bonding groups, and then we'd have two lone pairs, as in the case of water, the electron geometry is still tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry is described as being bent. So here we're asked to show the geometry, both electronic and molecular geometry, for PBr3. We count the number of electrons, 5 for phosphorus and 21 for the 3 bromines, gives me 26 in total, divided by 2 is 13 electron pairs. So I connected the central atom, phosphorus. And by the way, phosphorus. Phosphorus has electronegativity of 2.1, and bromine is 2.8, so phosphorus is central. I connect phosphorus to the three bromines. That's three pairs of electrons. I'm going to count to 13. Here's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. One pair left over on the central atom is 13. Now I've drawn it in a tetrahedral shape because there are four electron pairs. Four electron pairs gives a tetrahedral electronic geometry. Well, we would have to describe the molecular geometry as a trigonal pyramidal shape. Now I've gone one step further here. I calculated the difference in electronegativity between the bromine to phosphorus bond and it's 0.7, which is a polar covalent bond. The bonds are polar. And I draw in the dipoles pointing in the direction of the more electronegative bromine atoms. Since I now know the shape, I can talk about whether those dipoles cancel or not. In fact, they do not cancel. There's polar bonds with dipoles that do not cancel, and so as a whole, this molecule would be described as being polar or have a net dipole.
perhaps not the best rendering, but you can see the trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry of PBr3, much the same as that of ammonia, NH3. Let's take a look at sulfur dioxide. SO2 has a total of 18 valence electrons, 3 times 6 is 18, divided by 2 is 9 electron pairs. So we join the sulfur, the central atom, to the two oxygens with two pairs. We'll count to 9, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 1 is 9. And we see we have to share a pair of electrons from oxygen to sulfur. And we'll get structure looking like that, sulfur dioxide. And we already visited the idea that there are two possible resonance structures. That's still true. We simply want to look now at the shape. The shape of either one is the same as the other. We look at the central atom. We see it has three electron groups around it, a double bond, a non-bonded pair, and a single bond. Those three electron groups adopt a trigonal planar electronic geometry. But in terms of its molecular geometry, looking at only the atom groups, we have to say it's bent. Let's look at some examples of how dipoles in covalent compounds combine or cancel. So in these diagrams, the red arrows are dipole arrows in the bonds, and then the blue arrows represent the net dipole having combined all the red ones. Um, let's look at how strong the overall polarity of the molecule is. In the case of HCl, uh, there's a pretty significant dipole. Chlorine is 3.0 and hydrogen 2.1. The difference is 0.9, which would put us in the polar covalent range. And so HCl's total molecular dipole would be the same as its bond dipole. And Hydrogen chloride is, in fact, miscible, soluble in all proportions in water. It's polar. And that's one of the tests we use. Uh, polar molecules are soluble in water, whereas nonpolar molecules, like oil, hydrocarbons, gasoline, are not soluble in water. Here's uh, BCl3. If you look at the bond dipoles, chlorine is 3.0 and boron is 2.0. That difference is 1.0, and that's a polar covalent bond. And so there are, in fact, dipoles in the directions pointing towards the more electronegative chlorine atoms. But if you combine those three arrows head to tail, the net dipole is zero. There's no blue arrow shown. And so BCl3 is, in fact, a non-polar molecule because all the dipoles cancel. We would predict it's not soluble in water. But here's formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is, in fact, a flat, triangular, planar molecule. It has a fairly significant dipole between carbon and oxygen. Oxygen is 3.5. Carbon is 2.5. The difference is 1. Now, this author has drawn in some very small dipoles between carbon and hydrogen. The difference is only 0.4 which is considered nonpolar, but let's just assume for a second that there is a slight dipole. It's no problem because they point in the same direction as the oxygen. They all point upwards, and so there's a net dipole upwards. Oxygen is delta negative. This carbon is delta positive. Formaldehyde is a polar molecule because the dipoles don't cancel. We would predict that formaldehyde is soluble in water. In fact, it's miscible in all proportions in water. How about ammonia? This is the structure of the molecular geometry of ammonia. We have drawn here dipoles in from hydrogen to nitrogen. The bond has significant polarity. 3.0 for nitrogen, 2.1 for hydrogen. They're 0.9. They're all pointing towards the nitrogen. The net dipole, the sum of the three would be upwards. Nitrogen is delta negative on the top. The ammonia is delta plus on the bottom. Ammonia, in fact, is a polar molecule. It's soluble in all proportions in water. Now this is chloroform, CHCl3. Now, these dipoles are small in any case. Carbon to chlorine is only 0.5, and carbon to hydrogen is only 0.4. Questionable whether one should even draw a dipole here, but even if one does, 
you can see they're all pointing in the downward direction and there will be, will be a slight dipole toward this end of the molecule, slightly negative, this will be slightly positive. As a result, chloroform is slightly soluble because it is slightly polar as a whole molecule. And finally here, carbon tetrachloride. Again, we have these four uh, carbon to chlorine bonds. Difference in electronegativity is 0.5, but they're all pointing away from each other in a tetrahedral fashion. If you combine those four dipole arrows head to tail, they will cancel, and there's no net dipole for the molecule. Therefore, carbon tetrachloride is very much nonpolar and very much insoluble in water. So some problems here. Is carbon dioxide polar or a nonpolar molecule? So I've drawn a structure. I've drawn in dipoles because oxygen is electronegativity of 3.5 and carbon is 2.5. It's a pretty significant dipole. There's two of them equal in magnitude but opposite in direction so they will completely cancel. And we would then conclude that as a whole the molecule is nonpolar despite its polar covalent bonds. And it actually is, this is evidenced by its solubility in water. We predict low solubility in water and we're correct. Carbonated beverage manufacturers carbonate water, beverages, by pushing carbon dioxide gas into the liquid under high pressure, three to four atmospheres. And when you open a bottle of pop, you see immediately the carbon dioxide coming out because it really has a low solubility in water because as a whole, it's a nonpolar molecule. We're asked next to look at the water molecule. I've drawn its structure here. It has two oxygen to hydrogen single bonds and two non-bonded pairs of electrons. The electron geometry is tetrahedral. The molecular geometry is bent. The difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen is significant. 3.5 minus 2.1 is 1.4, so it has very polar bonds. Do those dipoles cancel? Well, in fact, they don't. Here's the dipole arrow on the right, and I combine them with the one on the left. Now, to combine dipole arrows, you join them head to tail. So visualize here, pull this dipole arrow. Here it is here, right up there, number one. And then combine, take this next one head to tail, bring it up here. So this is the second arrow. When you combine them head to tail, the resultant is the net dipole, and that's represented by this black arrow here. This end of the molecule is negative, this end of the air molecule is positive. Water is certainly a polar molecule, its dipoles don't cancel. Let's take another look at carbon tetrachloride. Here's this Lewis structure, four electron groups. They'll be tetrahedrally arranged as drawn here. Is there a dipole? Well, it's small, 3.0 minus 2.5 is only 0.5, but they're all going to be pointing away from each other in a tetrahedral fashion, and they will cancel. Carbon tetrachloride is a nonpolar molecule. Well, let's try these. We're asked to draw the structure of calcium chloride and PHF2. For calcium chloride, which atom is central? Well, calcium is a metal reactive metal with an electronegativity of 1 and chlorine is 3. That difference would be 2.0. On a metal to non-metal scale, 2.0 falls in the ionic region. So this is not a covalent compound, it's ionic. So the calcium will lose its two valence electrons from group 2A, two valence electrons. Each chlorine gains 1. This would be the combining ratio and this would be the lowest structure of calcium chloride. For PHF2, well, these are all nonmetals, so that would be covalent. How many electrons do we have here? I'm going to count um, 5 for phosphorus, 1 for hydrogen, that's 6, plus 14 for the fluorines is 20 valence electrons, or 10 pairs. How is it connected together? Well, hydrogen and fluorine are always terminal atoms, so phosphorus must be central. We'll connect these atoms together with single bonds that takes care of three pairs, and we'll count to ten. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So there's the Lewis structure of PHF2. 
Now the bond types. The bond between hydrogen and phosphorus is completely nonpolar because hydrogen and phosphorus have the same electronegativity. But the bond between phosphorus and fluorine is quite polar. Fluorine is 4.0, phosphorus is 2.1, the difference is 1.9. That would be definitely be a polar covalent bond with significant dipoles. And I've drawn them in here, and it's pretty apparent they won't cancel. So this right end of the molecule, lower right would be delta negative, and the upper left would be delta positive as I've drawn it. So we have identified here four electron groups. The electronic geometry is tetrahedral. Three atom groups, which would be trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry with a significant dipole in the molecule. In this slide, we're asked to draw the structure of this ion, BRO2 minus. That's actually bromite ion, which is the anion that forms when bromus acid loses its one acidic hydrogen. So I've gone ahead and drawn the structure of bromous acid, HBRO2, which has 20 valence electrons, divided by 2 is 10 pair. The layout, you recall, for oxy acids is that acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen and all oxygens to the central nonmetal. That takes care of three electron pairs. I need to count to 10, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Pretty easy to draw. And when bromite is formed, then the hydrogen ion leaves. The pair of electrons stays behind. And this then is the structure of bromite ion. Now, in this case, I say dipoles are not calculated. They're irrelevant. If you have an ion, we don't really worry about the dipoles. The fact that it's ionic renders it water soluble. So polar covalent compounds and many ionic compounds are soluble in water. However, we can still describe the geometry of it. We could draw the four electron groups around bromine as being tetrahedral, and the molecular geometry of the two oxygens around the bromine would be described as being bent. We're asked to draw the structure of SCN minus, that's called thiocyanate ion. And the number of electrons in this is um, four for carbon. 6 for sulfur makes 10, and then 5 for nitrogen makes 15, and one more for the negative charge is 16, divided by 2 is 8 pair of electrons. I've gone ahead and finished up the structure. Carbon must be central. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 pair of electrons, and there's two possible resonance structures for this molecule. There is not a third. You, remember, you can't have a triple bond be on a sulfur, so these are the only two resonance structures. I'll leave it to you to work out those two from the starting point. Before we conclude this lesson, this long lesson, I want to show you a couple more structures we haven't dealt with to this point. Say we're asked to draw the structure of lithium hydroxide, LiOH. We'll just use our procedure. Lithium's in group 1A, oxygen in 6, and hydrogen in 1. There's 8 valence electron or 4 electron pairs. Which atom is central? Well, it can't be lithium. The alkali metals, group 1A, can only ever form one bond, just like hydrogen and fluorine. So they're never central. Oxygen has to be. So I connect lithium, oxygen, and hydrogen with a single bonds gives me two more pairs to fit in. They'll go on the oxygen, and that's my structure of lithium hydroxide. Let's calculate the difference in electronegativity between these bonds. We've already seen the oxygen to hydrogen bond is quite polar. 3.5 minus 2.1 is 1.4. It's polar covalent. But what about the lithium to oxygen bond? Well, in fact, it's ionic because oxygen is 3.5 and lithium is 1.0, the difference is 2.5. That's clearly ionic. So I can't draw, I cannot draw a shared pair of electrons. Instead, I'm going to take that shared pair and say they belong to the oxygen. I have a lithium cation and a hydroxide anion. This is a polyatomic anion. Now I've gone ahead and drawn in the dipole over the OH bond, but it's kind of irrelevant. I wouldn't bother 
except that I've done it here, uh, because the fact that this is polar has no bearing. The fact that it's ionic renders it soluble in water, and that's what's important for us. So, at least in this compound, the you know, compound is ionic, and uh, it's water soluble as a result. Before I conclude this lesson, I want to leave you with three more structures to examine. This is ICN and KCN, potassium cyanide, and NASH, sodium hydrogen sulfide. Take a look at the bond types I've calculated, the structures, and the molecular and electronic geometries. You can pause the video and look at this. So let me say by way of summary for this long, long unit, the chemical bonds hold atoms together in molecules. We've seen three bond types, ionic, polar covalent, and covalent. Electronegativity enables us to predict the type of bond present. We draw structures that obey the octet rule or the duet rule if they're close to helium to become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas and gain stability. We've seen Lewis structures uh, or line bond structures. We use them to visualize the arrangement of atoms in a molecule. In polar covalent compounds, we draw dipole arrows over the polar covalent bonds. We can use Vesper theory to predict the shapes of molecules. We can combine dipoles when present to predict the overall molecular polarity, that is the dipole moment in covalent molecules. Well, thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. Cheers. Okay.